<clears throat> what you see here is uh, a nice landscape in rural Mississippi where I grew up. And uh, I used to spend a lot of time meditating in this kind of landscape in Mississippi. And uh, as, at a young age, I learned to live at the quantum superposition of many worlds that didn't talk to each other. My parents had emigrated from India to rural Mississippi, and uh, I grew up uh, going to a Southern Baptist church for school where uh, black and white people lived on different sides of the railroad. And uh, <clears throat> my dad is a surgeon, so I used to get to go to the hospital with him while he's doing surgeries and make rounds. And I love physics and mathematics. And at the home, in our home, we were exposed to concepts of Eastern philosophy like Vedanta and at school, Southern baptism and the Bible. And, <clears throat> and I love science. So uh, you can see kind of a quantum superposition of many different worlds. Today, we are celebrating Benjamin Franklin. Franklin's 312th birthday. He has been such an inspirational person for our mission here at the Franklin Institute that we couldn't help but celebrate a little bit about uh, his work. In particular, Ben Franklin did a lot of great uh, understanding for electricity, but what he also was an avid musician and a music lover. So his favorite instrument was actually to play water glasses. Many of you have probably done this before with stemware. So if you have stemware at home, you're welcome to try this. Kids, get your parents' permission first before you start pulling out their stemware. And just by getting a finger wet and running around the rim of a glass, we get a tone. Now, how many songs might you know that have only one note in them? Can't imagine there are too many. So if you would like to play a more complex piece or if you'd like to play a full song, uh, say happy birthday, you would need several glasses all finely tuned. Now, this glass has already been tuned for us. We just have to fill the water level to the correct amount to get a note. And this is a great way of being able to measure things out. If you have musical glasses, you can try with different levels of liquid inside of your glass, and you'll have different notes each time. Unfortunately, this isn't exactly foolproof of an instrument. Uh, during many different parties, you may have folks dancing. They could bump into your table and spill the liquid out of your glasses and then completely mess up your finely tuned instrument. Or if you're playing outside and it's particularly hot out and there's evaporation taking place, it could tune your instrument a slightly different way that you're not going to be able to get the correct notes that you're looking for. So one thing that's really interesting about this type of an instrument is that you don't really need to have the water inside the glass at all. So just emptying the glass, same process, we find that also the shape of the glass can be really instrumental in giving us a tone. Now this is where Ben's curiosity really takes off. So instead of having all of these glasses all lined all over the place with lots of different liquids in them that someone could spill or knock over or just accidentally bump during the course of a song, uh, ben thought, well, is there a way that I can improve upon this instrument? And he did. He actually created this instrument that you see in front of me here. This is called the glass harmonica. Not harmonica, there's no H. Glass harmonica. Uh, this is a tabletop version for demonstration purposes only. Obviously, this is very small. It has a hand crank. A full-size glass harmonica would actually have a foot pedal to be able to spin this entire cylinder of glass bowls. Voila, one of Franklin's favorite inventions. So uh, these are all wine glass, basically custom blown wine glasses and they're all nested inside of each other and the whole assembly is turning so you can play it somewhat piano-like. So here's a little bit from the Lucia. So I hypothesized some years ago that your DNA is like a piano. And the music that you as an organism make is an interplay of the information encoded in your DNA sequence, the information encoded in the environment, 
Franklin produced, apparently the number was eight, and I've tracked down seven of them, and I have a sniff on the eighth one. It was sold in 1939 at auction in Denver. So yeah. it's out there. So there's only... <laughs> it's so out there. During that time, there was only eight of these made. This Franklin is, made yeah. eight. One factory crazy. in northern France made 5,000 of these. Oh. Oh, okay. They made them all the way until 1946. There were factories in Italy, in Venice, and in Murano, and they were as common and as produced as pianos became in Victorian really? times. So oh, they were hugely popular. But then the problem started, <laughs> and they became banned. It became illegal to play them, illegal to own them, uh, illegal to make them. And that's all part of the mystery of the glass and the history, the, the famous glass d disorder. And we all have our theories about that. The symptoms peg it for me and every doctor I've spoken to. They lost their hair. They developed delirium tremens, went blind, ended up in asylums, the and their minds, they lost their minds. People um, thought that was because of the glass bowls. Well, yeah, with the players, yeah, yeah, over time. And so if you talk to any doctor immediately, they go, oh, lead poisoning. Glasses, which were made with high lead content. But the thing is, there's just not enough going on here for the lead to leach out into the skin. So the best theory that's coming around now is that lead was already a huge problem in the 18th century. So that's why these were illegal, because they thought that they gave you lead. Well, they called it the, the glass illness. They didn't say lead. It was just a mysterious illness. Because the main problem was it was killing people in the audience. It wasn't the players. Now, you start to play, you play your first notes, and somebody stand up, scream, and drop dead. Wait, and what? Yeah, it's a real famous uh, incident. Wait, what? This is like yeah. this is like documented, documented in if you believe everything you read in the newspaper. Like, My favorite the, the glass harmonica was killing this. audience members. Killing <laughs> audience members. Yeah. <laughs> you ever heard of mass hysteria? Yeah, yeah. That's the best explanation we have. People expected something to happen. So it did. So yes, people were keeling over. It would cause fainting men to revive. It would cause women to faint. Um, <laughs> what are you talking about? No, it's all documented. We use Moore's Law and these exponential technologies finally hitting the sensors and emitters like lasers and ultrasounds that I've worked with for decades to pioneer consumer electronics. The camera chip in all of your smartphone is really small. That's because if you use less silicon area, it costs less. So right now, the camera chip in your smartphone costs a buck and has pixel sizes the size of the wavelength of light. And that means we can record the waves in the wavelength of light or their phase, which gives us fundamentally more information. And what our images look like is a lot like the water out there on the Charles. We can read the waves and the interference patterns to extract more information as we use light that penetrates your body. We craft the shape of the waves and even um, can uh, steer the, the beams by, here you see a yellow line of emitters where the wave is delayed from one emitter to the next emitter so that we can focus near or far or with a similar principle, up, down, right, left, to deliver therapy wherever we wish to. So what we built is a series of, of headsets that are in uh, trials right now for diagnostics and therapeutics. And I'll talk to you about some of the diseases we're trying to get at. Here you see the glioblastoma cells represented by orange spheres can hide out amid neurons. So it's almost impossible for the neurosurgeon to get the whole tumor out and it divides really rapidly. But we exploit something that we haven't really seen exploited in the past in, in aggressive cancers. All aggressive cancers have this. They have brittle cell membranes. The brittle cell membranes can be exploited much like an opera singer can burst a wine glass because it's brittle and not harm anything else in the room while it shatters that wine glass. So we do that by applying a harmonic frequency to the glioblastoma cells so that they move. They're like rickety ships, these fast dividing cells with the brittle cell membranes. And so what we can do is then burst the glioblastoma cells and not harm any other tissue. We can excite neurons or suppress neurons. So we're starting some trials on severe depression and OCD 
severe depression one this year so that we can stimulate neurons. I mean, a lot of things cause mental disease, but one of the end results is either the neurons are firing too much or not enough. And so we can address that at different different harmonic frequencies. And we're working also on Alzheimer's with different harmonic frequencies that seem to do, and this is the, the earliest, there's some published research on it, that shows synaptogenesis and neurogenesis. So um, here's a bit on that. Transcranial magnetic stimulation is, is used um, and uh, direct current stimulation, but we can focus um, energy anywhere we wish to in the brain. So this interplay of the information embedded in the DNA sequence, the information in the environment, and the information in, let's call it for the moment, consciousness, whether it's your consciousness or a generalized consciousness, we'll revisit that later. That interplay actually modulates what information gets manifested out of that DNA. Could information in the environment be modulating which genes get turned on? which genes get turned off. Now, we know that from epigenetics, but could it be other kinds of information? Could it be physical forces, like mechanical forces, electromagnetic fields? Could other kinds of information be communicating with how these systems are reading and writing information into DNA? My lab at Nanobiosim uh, began harnessing some of these tools to build tools to precision control these nanomachines that read and write DNA. And several of these agencies started funding us more for the commercial and the applications that came out of this uh, than some of the deep science that actually inspired me for this. But uh, these are some of the applications that come out of being able to precision control nanomachines that read and write DNA at the single molecule level, including new ways of sequencing and amplifying DNA with high resolution. But also uh, something I'll talk a little bit about is can this be a machinery for information processing, information storage, and even quantum information processing. So here's just some of the, this is more of a classical control. Here we can take uh, the mechanical stress on a DNA molecule, the tension in piconewtons, and by tuning it, we can control the speed and the direction of how this little nano machine reads and writes DNA. So this is an example of some of the things we can do in our lab. We can stretch out single molecules of DNA and visualize in real time as a nano machine reads a DNA code. Now this is an example of how mechanical forces, no chemistry, no uh, biological system, but can modulate how the information encoded in DNA is being expressed. 